Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Wheeler Centre. Uh, my name is Chris Flynn. I'm the host for this evening. Uh, I'll be in conversation with Tony um, tonight, talking about his new book, uh, Common People. Uh, first order of business is um, I respectfully acknowledge that we're meeting today on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation. I pay respect to their elders, past, present, and future, and the elders from other communities who are here today. Second order of business Australia voted yes. <laughs> Can I get an amen up in here? Oh, you don't watch RuPaul's Drag Race, okay. Um, the icing on the, uh, or the cherry on the icing of the uh, non-discriminatory wedding cake for me was um, the fact that the federal MP um, whose electorate um, was the 10th highest um, yes vote was Tony Abbott. <laughs> so. Suck my balls, Tony Abbott. <laughs> Within the confines of a uh, legally binding uh, relationship uh, ratified by the state, of course. Um, <laughs> the event we're doing tonight is a little bit longer than usual because um, we have, on a day of positive news, we have another lovely surprise for you. Um, there will be a, an announcement and a presentation prior to Tony and I having a chat about his new book. And so with that in mind, I would like to introduce um, Bernadette Mary Brennan. He only learnt my second name because he said, can you be more Irish than me? I said, yeah, or more Irish than Bernadette Brennan. I'm saying, yes, Bernadette Mary Brennan. Hello, uh, thank you for having me. I'm here in a, my capacity as the chair of the Patrick White Award judging panel, and I'm joined tonight with another one of my judges, uh, Deborah Adelaide, who's flown down specially uh, for this event and will be flying back at nine o'clock tonight. She's so excited about this award. In 1973, Patrick White was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. With the prize money, he established the Patrick White Award an award given annually to, a, to an author who has, quote, already made a contribution to Australian literature, unquote, but who may not, in the opinion of the judging committee, and I quote again, have received due recognition for that contribution. That's the end of that quote. That's from the trust deed. White stipulated in the trust deed that this award was to operate as encouragement for the chosen writer to continue to write for publication. So this is an extremely important award. It's a writer's award for other writers, and it's about um, acknowledgement, thanks, and it's about encouragement. In 1974, Christina Stead was the inaugural recipient of the Patrick White Award. The list of winners since then is a who's who of Australian literature. Randolph Stowe, Thea Astley, Amy Whitting, Elizabeth Harrower, Gerald Manane, Faye Wiki, John Romerall, the list goes on and it's very easily uh, searched on a Google, just go in Patrick White Award and you will see the 43 so far um, recipients of this award. So each September, Associate Professor Deborah Adelaide David Carter, Professor David Carter from Queensland, who's devastated that he cannot be here tonight, and myself meet for many hours to decide on the recipient of this prestigious award. It is never an easy decision because we have so many great and worthy writers in this country, but it is always an uplifting decision. And the best part of my job as the chair of the judging panel is to contact the author and to tell them that they've won. This year, the judges are particularly thrilled to announce that for the first time in the award's 44-year history, the winner of the Patrick White Award is an Indigenous Australian writer, and you guessed it, one Tony Birch. <laughs> Have a seat. Now, usually this award is given uh, at a dedicated ceremony, and I read out the judge's long citation. That's not appropriate uh, tonight. Uh, but it was serendipitous, if you like, that Tony, uh, we were going to be 
having a ceremony tomorrow night at readings. And it turned out that Tony was here at the Wheeler Centre. So we thought, what better way to award this great Patrick White Award than to be here at the Wheeler Centre with Tony before he talks with Chris tonight. Uh, we've come here tonight to hear Tony speak. So I'm not going to take up much of your time. You already know the qualities of his work for which he is so rightly acclaimed. In the few minutes I have left, I want to read just two short excerpts from the citation which demonstrate clearly why Tony Birch is such a worthy recipient of this award. And I'm going to focus on Tony's latest collection because tonight is about common people. And so I'm hopeful that the words that I, I say now will lead productively into Chris and Tony's discussion. So in my more formal voice, Tony Birch's reputation as a writer of powerful, engaging and moving stories has grown steadily since the appearance of his first book, Shadowboxing, in 2006. He is now the author of four collections of short stories, two novels, a book of poetry, Broken Teeth, and a series of important essays, critical articles and reviews on subjects including Indigenous literature, the colonial legacy and climate change. Birch is also highly valued as a public speaker and lecturer. In his, most common, in his most recent book, Common People, he presents us with a world of hardship, danger or decline in inner city or rural settings where characters nonetheless find unexpected forms of sociability, love or purpose. Like some of the greatest writers, and critics have compared him to Juno Diaz and Raymond Carver, Birch has created a unique world, immediately recognisable whatever its local setting. Common People explores the lives of ordinary people trapped within the everyday, sometimes grim struggles of living. Unsentimental, gritty, stylistically restrained, these stories often contain small, unexpected gestures of kindness or compassion, investing the whole collection with a quiet optimism in human nature. And what a day to be talking about human optimism in, uh, quiet optimism in human nature. So Tony Birch is a major voice in contemporary Australian fiction and a critical spokesperson on issues concerning race, Australian history, Aboriginal rights and climate change. He is the first Indigenous Australian to be awarded the Patrick White Literary Award and the judges congratulate him on this deserved recognition. Um, I just want to say a few thank yous. Firstly, um, to Bernadette for those um, incredibly um, generous words. So I want to thank um, Bernadette and the Perpetual Trust and all the hard work they do year after year um, on this award. I've been a judge on awards before and I know it takes up a lot of time and effort and um, I want to thank the um, Trust very much for their, for their effort. I also want to thank the judges very much. Um, thank you, Deborah, for coming all the way um, from Adelaide to Melbourne. Um, I know David Carter, who can't be here, sent me a, a wonderful email today, and I, I know David um, professionally in another capacity and, and um, have had wonderful conversations with him around history and Australian culture. So I want to thank the um, judges for the decision that they made. I also want to thank the Wheeler Centre. It is wonderful for me to um, receive this award here at the Wheeler Centre. Um, I do regard it as a sort of a second home. Um, there are wonderful, wonderful people here, Michael, um, Gemma, um, Emily, Helen, and all the staff here have been great supporters of my writing over the years, and um, it is just a wonderful um, outcome to that the talk tonight coincided with this possibility. So I, I feel in great gratitude to the Wheel Centre who have been terrific supporters of mine. Um, I want to thank Andrew down the back at Hill of Content Books who are also great supporters of my writing and always have been. And every time I go past the, the shop, um, Andrew gets me to sign a couple of books and then gives me a 10% discount on any purchases that I make. Um, Hill of Content is such an old bookshop in Melbourne and such an institution. And um, I really appreciate um, the, the great support that they, they've given me. Um, it's also wonderful that this coincides tonight with having um, family and friends here. So to my family, Sarah and Nina, um, to, my, to my mum and dad and to, to my sisters who are here. Um, it's wonderful to have you here. 
I also have some wonderful friends here, even my, a few people from my class of 69 have turned up. So if you've got school friends going back to 1969, which amounts to 45 years of friendship, um, you weren't such a rat bag after all, I presume. So they're wonderful friends to have along. And also, um, it's wonderful to do the conversation with Chris. Um, Chris Flynn is, is not only a great friend of mine, he's been a great um, supporter of my writing. And um, several years ago, um, Chris Flynn was able to get myself and the absolutely mighty Alan Van Nerven published in, um, in the States in McSweeney's magazine. So I was sort of hip for a day. Um, and since that um, beginning of those relationships, Chris and I have had so many wonderful discussions about writing over the years, and we catch up quite regularly. If we're not talking about lost dogs, we're talking about literature. And he's not only a wonderful writer, he's a wonderful critic. Um, I think he has probably more understanding of Australian writing than anyone that I know, and that's because he comes from somewhere else, so he doesn't have to wave a flag. Um, so it's, it's really wonderful, Chris, to, to have you here tonight. And in regard to um, Patrick White, I would like to say something to me that's very important. Um, Patrick White, as well as being a, a winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, was an incredible campaigner um, for things such as environmental protection. He was a campaigner against uranium mining, campaigner against nuclear waste dumps. He was a campaigner against the attempts to destroy inner city neighbourhoods in Sydney. And something else that people will know probably little about that I found out for a friend of mine that um, Patrick was also an incredible supporter of the um, establishment of the Aboriginal Health Service in Redfern in Sydney in the early 1970s. So I think he is a writer who does what I hope that writers do, that we, we simply don't sit in silence in our garrets and, and scribble away at our fiction, that we have a voice that we, we must um, use and we must use it in, the, in a time of need. So with um, the lead that Patrick White gave us over so many years, I would suggest, if I could just say in closing, that there are two things I would like you at least to think about. One is climate change, obviously, and you can learn about climate change and protection of country by going um, online and looking at the SEED Indigenous Youth Climate Change Coalition, look at the work they do and think about possibly supporting them. And a second group, I think, who are absolutely vital to our understanding of Australian life at the moment is RISE, which is a group supporting um, detainees in Manus Island at the moment, and that is a group led by ex-detainees themselves. So I would suggest that you look at, see what RISE are doing, see what SEED are doing, and think about what you could do to, to help them. So thank you very much. I drank your water before. I know, I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> My daughter would have a fit if I did that. Before we start, I should say that um, as an Irishman, it seems very odd for me that, um, that Ireland should be ahead of Australia with something, so I'm glad that you guys are actually catching up. Uh, I suppose next thing you know, you'll be entering the Eurovision Song Contest. I could be, I could be. Uh, I'm just hearing, just getting news that you've actually been in it three times, so. <laughs> <laughs> that makes no sense whatsoever. No. We, we could do a duo next, next year. I, I don't think anyone wants to hear that. Um, Tony and I do meet up pretty regularly. Um, he actually took me to a new place a few weeks ago, um, which makes a change. Um, and we were chatting about how when you come to these kind of events, sometimes um, you get moderators who are a little bit in love with their own voice and um, do quite a lot of the talking and don't let the author talk very much. And, ask very highfalutin questions, um, and would much rather just talk about their own work. So that's what we're going to do tonight. <laughs> um, no, so we're going to do things a little bit differently tonight. We're going to go through the stories in common people, quite a few of them, and just get into specific stories and talk about what the stories are about and who the characters are, and we'll just see where that takes us. Um, because sometimes these moderators, you feel like they haven't even read the book, you know? So Tony, obviously I haven't read the book. Um, who has time for that, you know? Um, but that's okay, I skimmed it, so I'm sure we'll be all right. Um, do you want to get stuck into some of the stories then? And, we'll, and you can tell us a little oh, bit about If you're it. finished with the jokes, yes. Yeah, yeah that's, that's it. <laughs> I know. Um, all right, I've been suitably reprimanded. Um, Paper Moon, can, yeah. we, can we just start, can I just say story titles and then you can talk? 
if you want to. Well, Paper Moon, which is about a young girl visiting her father in what seems like some kind of mental institute. Is that, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the story? Yeah, well, I mean, just a little synopsis of the story, and, and probably it's, um, it probably is a story that in the collection is, is one of my personal favourites. And essentially it's a story about a girl whose father, who's a, who's a, a very gentle man, um, and he makes her this beautiful paper moon for her bedroom when she's afraid of the dark. But her father has a nervous breakdown and he ends up in a psychiatric institution. And when the girl thinks that her father has, has actually died or, or possibly run away with another woman, she confronts her mother. Her mother tells her what's actually happened and takes the girl to visit the father in the institution. And the girl proceeds eventually to help her father or attempt to help her father escape from the institution. Um, essentially, I think I've, I've spoken about this recently at the Australian Short Story Festival in Adelaide. I think it's a story revisiting the, the last story in, in um, Shadow Boxing, um, the story of the haircut, where the adult Michael in that book gives his father Mick a haircut in a psychiatric institution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even though this is a story about a young girl and a father, I think in some ways it's about a story, possibly psychologically, of me forgiving my father or me wanting to project a different type of relationship. So it's quite a gentle relationship. What I love about the story as a writer also, it's, it's very gently paced. Mm. So I didn't want it to be a story, you know, it's not a cuckoo's nest story with shock treatment and sort of dramatic moments. It's a deliberately very quiet story as if you are seeing it through the eyes of the girl so that rather than her be in a sense probably in a chaotic state because she's not sure what's going on, the story is actually told from her world. So I loved writing the story in a nice, gentle pace, and even though we're not sure what's going to happen, it's unlikely you would think what would happen would be her wish, is that I just love the moment of the story of her and the dad just sitting on the bus quietly next to each other and nothing's happening. So I actually love the, the yeah, I love the gentleness of the story. It is quite wistful, the story, because I mean, she thinks a lot about the walks she used to go down by the river with him whenever she was a little girl. Yeah, and, and it's interesting that because, yeah, there's that moment where, where he makes the, um, the paper moon for her and then when they go on the long walk down the river, um, he doesn't initially want to take her because she, he, it's a long walk and mm -hmm. it finishes uphill and he talks about tiring out and she says, I won't tire out. She does tire out, of course, and he carries the carrier, last yeah. section of the, the walk home. And, and that, that, for me, is really important about your kids who are so excited when they're small about what you're going to do, and they want to do it. Although, again, my daughter's here. She, when she was a kid, she wouldn't walk to the milk bar, but anyway. <laughs> um, it is that, that the excitement of children and you giving in to them but you know what's going to happen. So when she's really worn out, he doesn't say, you know, you should never come on this walk. I knew you'd... He picks her up and carries her home. Um, so I wanted that gentleness to be central to the story. Um, and to be honest, so I wrote that story, the first draft, very easily. It's what I would call a clean draft. Yeah. And it was one of those times when you, you're on, you know, you write the story and you think, yeah, I've, I've done what I wanted to do. So the, the redrafting was literally just, just tidying up. I, I'm reluctant to go into it, but you did bring it up about that you had a fractious relationship with your own father that you sort of were trying to repair a little bit through these stories. I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't know that you had a, a bad relationship with your dad. You didn't read Shadowboxing. Actually, I haven't read Shadowboxing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's true, uh, I haven't. No. Yeah, and I, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't probably use the term repair. I think it's... Um, I think for people it's a sense of resignation and acceptance mm. or a letting go of, of, of anger so that... Um, yeah, you know, would, I couldn't imagine a story on that relationship which has got a Hollywood ending, but yeah. one where, you know, in the end, as you get older yourself, you've got, you have to make decisions about those around you. And I think in the end, particularly with family, you've got to make decisions to be, to be with family emotionally. And, or if you make the opposite decision to not connect with family, you've got to be, um, I would imagine, you know, really clear about that decision, which, which certainly is not a way that I would think. Yeah, there's there's some lovely little details in this story too, though, of like the Australian flag hanging really limply outside the institute and the various characters inside. I, I love the uh, 
the guy who's got his floral boxer shorts on and he's yeah. just dribbling the soccer ball. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about how you how you come up with those that sort of level of detail for this sort of well, story? Well, I, I think just on those two that you mentioned, I think that the the sort of limp Australian flag it, it was more to represent this is the sort of failure of institutions in Australia generally. So when I, that story is normally sort of set around the early seventies before the end of institutionalisation, and when I we I went to go out to visit my, my dad with my mum when I was a teenager, these were massive places. Like when you you they were massive buildings. They were on extent expansion grounds. I mean, the weird thing is when I first went to see my father in the psych unit, you know, I thought it was like a park and it was really cool because there was a barber shop and a <laughs> canteen and I thought, this is amazing. It's like a little <laughs> city, you know, and you don't know people inside you know, copying it. And um, it was it's a failure of institutionalisation. And that character of the guy dribbling the, the football or the ball around the room, I mean, in part, it, it's just the sort of flashes of memory that I have of of particularly men who, who, one, that were in psych care when my dad was there, but also men, which is common to the book, men that I've seen around and met in the streets since, and that um, men, mostly men, although we know that women are in great, grave danger when they live on the streets, but people who I want to sort of give some attention to and not, yeah, certainly not to poke fun at them either. So I see these people as, as important, even though they only appear momentarily in some stories, as really important to the stories that I'm that I'm writing. Hey, um, to jump forward to another story, perhaps another one of your favourites, I think, is Frank Slim. Yeah. And the men, the men in that are really interesting too, because they're yeah. Not, not, they're not in, well. There's some pretty bad men in that, but there's also some quite um, quite good men who are not very um, effective. Yeah, and Frank Slim is probably. Yeah, it's in some ways parts of that story are quite visceral. Mm. Um, it was another story that I, I really enjoyed writing. And what I wanted to do in that story is that it's a really important dynamic in that story. So Viola is a, a, a madam, she, she runs a brothel, and she takes a child in. And again, going back historically, this is not the story, but, um, you know, in our street photographs when we were kids, there always used to be this kid on the end of the photographs, he's in a few of our photographs, this kid Jimmy, and yeah, people say, well, who, yeah, there's your cousin, there's your sister, there's your brother, who's that kid? Well, that's Jimmy, Jimmy you yeah. know. And Jimmy was a kid who was taken in by a woman who ran a brothel in Fitzroy. And yeah, you hear those stories of kids who are taken in by, by people who would never formally adopt them. And he lived in a, in, in a brothel for a while. And I just remembered that, but I wanted to take it over to this story. But the real key is that um, Viola is very protective of this boy that she takes in, and then there's a really violent incident that occurs. And the rest of the story spins on what we might call sort of, you know, where does power lie in, at this time in the, in the, you know, again, a story normally set probably in the 60s. Right. Where does power lie? And Viola... She has no power with regard to the police. She has no power with regard to any authorities, but she has money, she has connections, and she has a history of good relationships. So that is how she decides to utilize her relative power against a man who is extremely psychopathically violent. And then we bring in this third character, Frank Slim. And what I loved about the Frank Slim character is one that I heard that name on a documentary <laughs> and it just stuck with me. It was so poetic. And then I wanted to write this story where Frank Slim is a character who never speaks. He only acts on That's Viola's right. instructions. And that the dilemma for a reader, maybe the moral dilemma, is saying, is this the way that we should really deal with violence? And I think in a relative sense, it's exactly the way that we, or it was dealt with. So we mightn't deal with it now, and there'd be good reasons not to, but at the time that this story is set, Viola knows both her limitations and what she can do, and she decides to act. And ultimately, her actions are again to protect the child. So I, I, I love the moral ambiguity of the story, and also, it might be a story that some readers would have a disagreement with the ending or mm. what Viola does, but that's, that would be fine as long as they understood what the story's trying to do. So it was another story that, when I finished it, sometimes you get that sense, this story's doing exactly what I wanted it to do or close enough to it. So it was, it was a story of great satisfaction. Having said that, as, as Jacqueline um, Blanchard, my moral compass and editor from UQP will know, it started off as a, 
a, a novel that I got up to 70,000 words and just <laughs> eventually got back to 3,000. <laughs> I like the story because it reminds me a lot of growing up um, on the housing estate in Belfast whenever I was a kid, where um, matters were dealt with on a very sort of local level. There was this inherent mistrust yeah. of the authorities. They were malevolent, they were yeah. un untrustworthy. And so you never brought them into things, you dealt with things yourself. Yeah. And that's, um, I thought that was interesting. It's and also with, with Viola, it's about how she will deal with men. So she, yeah. runs, she runs a brothel, yeah, or a house. So she's got men as customers, she's got men as potential pimps, yeah, because this kid's mum goes off with a guy who she knows is going to be trouble. Yeah. She's got police who she can never trust. She's got this Desmond who comes around. And then she's got Frank Slim. She's got the guy who works for her. So it's about her negotiating men. And I think that I wanted the story to end with her, the reader understanding that within that relative limitations, Viola made, I think, really the best decision she could make for herself and for the boy. Mm -hmm. um, let's jump to one of the, the other stories. So there's a couple that um, we wanted to talk about sort of in tandem with each other. Um, Sissy and the white girl. Mm -hmm. um, let's me think about Sissy first, mm -hmm. which is this great story about the sort of fair-skinned Aboriginal girl who's selected to go on a holiday. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about this story? Well, that, that story is really interesting because I started to write quite an autobiographical story. Um, and my family here will know this story because I, I tell the same story. I've, been, I've told this story 475 <laughs> times at home. You've never heard it before, Jacqueline, so you're going to love it. Um, when I was a, a kid, um, my older brother and sister went on a holiday to Corion. Corion? Yeah, I'd never heard of it. It's on the Murray River. Not, if you're from Corion, it's a lovely place, um, apparently. And they went, they went on an aeroplane. And I just... I mean, that's incomprehensible. It's like saying, I'm going to the moon tomorrow, OK? And I said to my mum, I want to go. I want to go next year. And she said, OK, because, you know, I'm a pesky kid and I would have driven my mother crazy. And so next year, it turns out that the nuns are sending me to Rosanna. <laughs> oh, very funny. Um, <laughs> so, and I thought, Rosanna, I wonder what country that's in. Um, Rosanna, and for weeks I was imagining I'm going out to the airport, I'm going to fly to Rosanna, I'm going to get off at Rosanna and people are going to put garlands around my neck. Yeah. And so this woman turns up one day in this little mini minor and this is like, I know this sounds like a cliche, but she's got a twin set and pearls and gloves on that she never took off and she's sort of standing on, in the gut. I go, I don't want to come too close. Um, and she takes me to Rosanna, so we get in a little car and we drive down Brunswick Street and we drive up Heidelberg Road and then we stop outside this triple cream front brick veneer in just over Heidelberg. And I thought, we must be picking up some other kids on the way to the airport. <laughs> so she goes, I'll get out. So we get out of the car and I had some clothes in a cardboard suitcase. They took the clothes out into the backyard, started a fire in one of those 44 gallon drums and burned all my clothes um, and then gave me some hand-me-downs from this kid, Harold. Imagine wearing hammy dance from a kid, Harold. And if there, if there are any Harrys here, we apologise. But um, and then they took me to the dentist and had all my teeth taken out. Um, didn't tell my mum about it. And then they wanted to keep me. As you could imagine, I, I'm not the ugly man you see before. I was beautiful when I was six, and they wanted to keep me. Um, and yeah, my mum strangely said, "I don't think that's going to happen," and got me back. I started to write that story, but it was too upsetting. Yeah, yeah. And I usually don't get upset. And, and I've written some pretty close material. And then I thought, no, I'm going to drop that, but I want to tell a story. So Sissy, I turned into a story about a lovely girl, and she's having this sort of tussle with her mate. And they, they're two Aboriginal girls, and they're sort of arguing about, you're only going because your skin's fairer than mine. You're going. And she goes, no, it's not, because I did really well at school. She goes, you only did well at school because your skin's fairer than mine. So all these things. And it was a story that I was going to mimic the real story. And then I thought, it, I thought, no. Sissy's going to win the, the battle here. Mm -hmm. And it's a story that changed. It was one of those, these things as a writer, particularly if you're de dealing with autobiographical experience, it was actually a story where I thought, no, I don't want to tell my story. I want to tell Sissy's story, and Sissy's going to come out of this a lot differently. So the story, in, in part, it's, it's a, yeah, when her girlfriend her girl, has a sort of a girl crush on her, which I, which I really like writing. But 
It's a story, one, about the obsession with um, these kids by these people who want to take them in. And the reason that I wanted her to have a win is to say, well, there, is, there, are, there were opportunities where kids could have been lost to communities, but they weren't. So, um, And also the other dilemma in the story, not in my life, in the story, is the mother is in real fear of her daughter going. And people say, how would you let your kid go on a holiday? Well, yeah, if you're a kid growing up in the inner city of Melbourne, you've never been anywhere, and yeah. you, you say to your mum, I want to go on a holiday, for a parent to say no would have been, because my parents never went on a holiday. No one I knew had ever been on a holiday. So part of it is you want your kids to go and enjoy themselves. And having said that, I remember the year after or two years after me and my old sister Deborah, we went to Albury on a train on our own. And Deborah happened to get, Debbie, sorry, she'll, she'll kill me if I say Deborah. Debbie happened to get in a house that had a sort of a swamp out the back. And when I went round to see her, Debbie's with this tribe of kids in these plastic canoes just from a month at each other for a month. So she had a, she had a great time and I think she learned to ride a bike. So you could have a great time. But this was all organised through the church, was it? Oh, yeah. It was organised organized through the church, which is not unusual because in those days, if you look at a suburb like Fitzroy, which people will know I did my academic work in, a friend of mine, well, sort of a friend of mine, Pio, um, um, used to call Fitzroy the pinhead of civilization, and it's quite interesting because every welfare agency in Melbourne had a presence in Fitzroy, every church agency had a, prison, a presence, and we were like the test, the social test tube. Right. So everyone wanted to have an experience with poor kids. Now, some of those experiences were good, and some of them were terrible. Um, and when I say good, the same place that organised the trips. We used to go around there on a Saturday morning and they had double-decker baths. Like, people can't believe this. And we'd have a bath there on a Saturday morning because we didn't have a bath at home. So going around there, having a bath, and then um, walking out with two loaves of bread and a bag of bacon bones on the arm was like, whoa, I've hit the jackpot, you know. So there were parts of that that I actually loved. What year was this, Tony? Oh, this would have been from when we were going there from the late, around 1960 to the mid-60s, and it certainly that would have continued into the early 70s. But that, it also would have been going for a lot longer than that. And so, I mean, excuse my, excuse my ignorance, but so these families wanted to keep kids. Well, uh, no, um, not every family did, but you hadn't seen photos of me as a child. I'm sure you're, I'm sure you're a cherub, yeah. They wanted to keep me. And I reckon the reason they wanted to keep me we're supposed to be really talking about the stories, but the reason they wanted to keep me <laughs> is that when I got to the house, Harold's older sister was at Catholic Ladies College, which was then in East Melbourne, a very expensive Catholic girls' school. She was a year ahead of me. Harold was in my year. And the father suddenly, he, he organised one night a little, it's academic, you know, a school quiz night where we were pitted against each other in maths and English. And I blitzed these two kids. And I think what the father thought is, this is a dirt poor kid from the inner city who's got the ass out of his pants. I'm paying for this girl for thousands of pounds to go to school, and he's just ducks this. I want to keep him. <laughs> <laughs> I want him. But there was no way for them to keep you, right? Oh, no. I mean, I, no. In fact, in our case, it wouldn't have happened. But, I mean, people will be surprised about this. If you wanted a kid taken from family, and people here can look this up, and he's in my PhD, all you had to do was to get the parents before the court and have them charged with neglect. Yep. If the court agreed that it was neglect, you were made a state ward, and then you could be fostered. And neglect is a very loose term. It's not about, yeah, your parents not you know, feeding you, not working. Your parents, like my mum, she worked really hard in the house, worked really hard in factories, kept us in the best nick we could. If a social worker wrote a bad report on you, you could be before the court. The other thing you've got to remember, depending, I know, and it's a bit complex, some Aboriginal kids would have been classed automatically as state wards, depending on whether parents came under the, the, the Aborigines Act or citizenship. Right. Now, that's very complicated, but there were kids who were born into being state wards. So if you had a woman, any woman whose child was taken from her at birth or from a young age, if that kid was made a state ward, it's very hard for that kid to be unmade a state ward. And even if that child went back home, if there's any indiscretion, or let's say that child was with a mother and then a Catholic family or any family said, we would like to give that kid a holiday, and, the, and then they applied to foster that kid, because that kid is a state ward, the decision of whether that kid would go back to the parent is not made by the parent, it would be made by the court. Mm -hmm. 
So it's very, I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's not surprising to come under the gaze of a social worker was a very dangerous thing. Well, in just ch- jumping back to Frank Slim, um, when that, that guy Dez comes around to rob, to rob the brothel, mm. um, he doesn't threaten her with the police. No. He threatens her with the welfare. That's right. Yeah. And people, the welfare is a noun. I mean, um, people say the welfare is coming. Mm. And when people say the welfare is coming, yeah, that's when people would, might have to tell someone living in the house to nick off, to, to scrub the house. And, you know, to, the welfare were very dangerous because they could do, their, their, their control over your lives is very strong. And, you know, I, I think it's, and there'd be some people in the audience to know who would realise this, you know, that you, f- you find women who are house clean obsessive, like my mum. Yeah, you know, I used to drop my kids off at my mum sometimes when I was in the fire brigade at you know, half past seven in the morning. She's already vacked the house upside down. She, she, get you out of bed to make the bed. <laughs> um, she's hosed the gutter, hosed the front veranda, hosed the footpath. And then I used to think she'd go back inside and she'd look around and think, all right, I'm ready if they come. <laughs> and so women are always on their guard. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, as a child, you would be sort of tutored and, you know, it's an interesting thing, and I think it's relative to the sissy story in, in particular, is you would be tutored about who you would and wouldn't talk to and what you would say when you were spoken to. Yeah. So if you were, you know, if a policeman asked you a question, if a social worker asked you a question, if a teacher asked you a question, you have sort of responses that protect your privacy. And, and people sort of don't understand that or might again say, well, why would your parents sort of educate you to tell a lie. Well, they're educating you to protect your family. They're not, they're not turning you into sort of street urchins. No. Um, which I think the greatest disloyalty I ever did to my family was one day I came home in a police car just for a ride, you know, so <laughs> I was too friendly to the local cops, which wasn't looked down too well on our family. No. I understand that completely because uh, the, the social services were the big um, scary demon around our, yeah. our way too. Yeah. Um, the white girl, let's go on to that story, which is this another sort of great story about um, this young kid who's got a, a crush on a girl in his class, um, and he ends up in a bit of an odd sort of situation as a result of this. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the white girl? Well, I, I think there are several things at play here. The white girl is um, from a, a, a religious family. Her mum is a, a religious fanatic, and her dad's the, the new copper in town. And this kid... The thing is, he's a dirt poor Aboriginal kid, um, but he doesn't. He's got no um, shame about that, or a little bit of shame possibly over you know, his lack of um, hygiene. But he's a pretty tough kid. Um, she's a very precious girl, but she befriends him, and the story sort of spins in two parts on their relationship. So that while there might be that sense that this kid might feel ashamed or he might feel beholden to the girl, he doesn't. So he's a very resilient kid. Um, and then, unfortunately, she, she invites him home um, and he knows that her dad's a copper and that's what he's initially concerned about. But, you know, he hadn't met the mum. So, yeah. And the mum, again, is this, she's an obsessive, she's a religious obsessive, she's, she's a hygienic obsess, obsessive. And a couple of people said it's an odd ending, this story, um, which I won't give away, maybe. Um, but And this is not a, an excuse for why it's ended, it is partly the, based on a friend of mine who had an experience where a woman picked him up in the street and took him home, and she took him home and bathed him, put him in a girl's dress, put a wig on him, um, made his face up, put him in bed and cuddled him to sleep. And um, he, even as that old said, it was the best day of his life because she <laughs> gave him ice cream. But um, <laughs> um, So it was a partly dealing with that, obs- it's a bit heightened, the drama is deliberately yeah. heightened towards the end, but it's about this woman being obsessed with saving this boy and purity. And I'm always interested in this issue of, of hygiene because it is an obsession with people who want to save Aboriginal people, people who want to save the poor. It's an obsession. And in fact, it's an interesting obsession because there's this sort of sense that these people, because they're out there, they must be dirty. 
We have right. to clean them. The great unwashed. Yeah, we are the great unwashed. And the irony is that we were overwashed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so by the time they got us, we were, t- yeah, we'd been washed um, so too many times. And it's, isn't that funny? I, I, I look after my granddaughter, Isabel, every Monday, and I was taking her up the street yesterday, and she had a bit of... I committed that sin of giving her chocolate ice cream. She had a bit of tail, telltale chocolate here. And I had a, a handkerchief, and I spat on it and cleaned it. And I remember my mum, every time you're going to get your photo taken, you didn't mind getting your photo taken, but was the scrubbing beforehand? Because she, she'd get a hanky and spin it and then <laughs> wipe your face. Yeah. And I was reminded of this. I was at, um, in, in Perth last week at a... At a a history conference, and there's a great photographer there from Broome, an Aboriginal guy, and he said, you know, I'm not interested in people coming touring Broome wanting to take photos of Aboriginal kids in the dirt with fly-infested faces. He said, I'll take photographs of young kids in Broome and they can come around my studio. He said, if they turn up with a bit of dirt on their face or their, you know, something wrong with their pants, he says, get home, <laughs> get home, clean your face and come back when you're tidy, because he said, I'm not here to produce poverty porn. Right. So and these kids come back in their best clothes and glamming it up, and he, he he loves that. And you know, in all the photographs, and my mum took most of our photographs with you know initially those sort of box brownie cameras. You know, you you might get sort of gather you together as kids in the street, but yeah, you comb your hair, you mm. you get a spit clean on your face. So um, I've always said this that women in particular running houses in those suburbs. So. We're living in a one-bedroom house. One bedroom, like, well, two rooms at a front room and second room. And then a lean-to kitchen, no running hot water, no shower, no bath, anything. And women, their whole lives about how do we make this function so that my kids are clean, that my kids get fed, that my kids are presentable. And they did it. Which turns out you end up with children who are OCD. <laughs> As, again, my daughter would ascribe to, yeah. But it's always... A, I know there's a towel in her room right now sitting on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a great point of pride for the working class, though, is to be clean and to sort of defy that, that stereotype that people oh, have of them. And, it, it's, it, and I, admit, I know that, you know, and I've written about this, sometimes women would be overwhelmed by their situation, whether it be poverty, you know, a violent man in their life, maybe they didn't have those great extended family connections that we had, where it just becomes too much and, yeah, their world falls apart. But they were rare exceptions. What I remember is women being great um, team players with each other, looking out for each other. And I have this great story, um, uh, Aboriginal woman, Arnie Eleanor Harding, who came from Fitzroy, from Darnley Island in the 50s. And I said to her, why'd you go to Fitzroy? She said, oh, someone told me it was like the Wild West. And she said, when I got there, it was. Um, but she lived in a boarding house, and she's told me this great thing, that when you live in these boarding houses, there might be four or five families in a big terrace. Mm. And those families only have one room each. And usually they would have a kitchenette and maybe a little bath on each level. And she said... If you've been out all day, if you've been working, and you said, yeah, the, the Italian woman's got one room, you've got another room, another woman, she said, you have to find a way to get along with those people because if you don't, your kids won't get fed, they won't get bathed. So women who otherwise mightn't have had much social connection had great ability to, you know, to give each other space to do, to do stuff. So I think if there wouldn't have been for... The, the, that ingenuity of women, I think families would have probably, you know, more families would have collapsed or suffered, I think. Mm. But in this story, the white girl, the, um, the, the, the crazy mother, she seems to have, is it a guilt that she has? The, the sort of white guilt that she wants to, I don't fully understand it. Is it, is it, is it because she feels guilty that she needs to sort of um, treat all the Aboriginal kids like charity cases that have to be helped? I think in the in the case of in the case of this woman, she, she's she's obsessed with a calling, and yeah, there's a lot in this story about her that's not told, and I wouldn't say that's deliberate or or, or that it's unknown to me. I wanted to play it out in the sense that that 
the boy, it's more that I wanted the readers to sense the boy doesn't realise the level of danger that he's going to be in mm. because he's just thinking about, oh, this is a policeman. You know, I'm worried about going to the house of the policeman. So I can't answer the question in the sense that I, I, I didn't resolve that deliberately because yeah. I wanted the... Because it's sort of, again, it's a slightly an innocent story about a crush on a girl and it, it becomes much more malevolent. Yeah. And that that was sort of a deliberate shift to the story. Um, yeah, she's just a, a crazy religious freak who voted no in the <laughs> same-sex marriage campaign. That's true. true. <laughs> and it got her nowhere. Yes. Um, let's talk about uh, some another two stories that have got similarities. Um, Joe Roberts and mm -hmm. Worship. Yeah. Um, Joe Roberts is this... Um, it's, it's, it's a story that's essentially just about a man visiting the doctor. Yeah. Right. Tell us a little bit about Joe Roberts. Joe Roberts um, is the longest story in the collection and actually is my, my favourite story in the right. collection. Um, as um, one of the reviewers of the book noted, noted, it is another reference to Bruce Springsteen because Joe Roberts is a, a song on the um, Nebraska album, but not the same Joe Roberts. Um, I tell you what I wanted to do. I wanted to write a story. Okay, just the the basis of the idea was that, um, as people will know, I'm I'm a runner and I've been running for now 38 years. Yeah, once you start running from the police, you just never stop. You just keep going. <laughs> um, I've been running for 38 years, and I went for a run about 10 years ago now around Princess Park, and Sarah um, was at the Australian Centre, and Grace and Nina, our younger daughters, were there, and. Um, I came back and I went to the tour to have a wee and it was like I was in um, The Shining. Just I looked down at the tour bowl and it was pure, dark red blood. And I thought straight away, yeah, being a, a drama, like, when did I say drama queen? Now are we? No, a drama man. Um, <laughs> that um, I was dying, of course. It's the first thing you think, of course, this is the end. Yeah. Um, so we went over to Royal Melbourne Hospital and uh, over the course of a couple of weeks, I had a series of tests. So if you ever want to get free tests, um, just tell the doctor you've been bleeding furiously yet when you went to the toilet and they'll give you um, all these tests in a hurry. Um, so I had a lot of really invasive tests. Um, and, and what's interesting is that you've got to give yourself over to the intimacy of that. Can you show uh, me? Yes, yeah, so I can. Out I, the back later. Um, we could, yeah. Um, and you have to give yourself over to the intimacy of that. And I was interested in the way you become sort of childlike. Yeah. And you're both completely reliant on these people taking care of you, and they do. So that the, the scrub sisters, and I know this because I used to work in operating theatre, the nursing sisters who looked after me, they're incredibly funny and gentle. And I was interested in the way that their physical touch worked against your body, so that they would touch you lightly, but in places that just gave you reassurance that you're being looked after. And then it was coupled with something I'd read about, which people will know about. And the saddest thing about people who are on their own is the, the complete absence of intimacy and just physical touch. Mm. So older people, people who live on their own who, you know, and it might sound a bit naff, but, yeah, they never get hugged. And, yeah. and that can be really debilitating. Babies who don't get hugged and how it can be really debilitating. So this guy, Joe Roberts, he's 60-ish. He lives on his own. And that day is about him interacting with people at various levels, whether it be the kid downstairs, the cat, the girl on the railway station, and it gets more physical and intimate as he goes along through the hospital, about his reaction to that. And there's that nice moment, that, well, I think a nice moment, where he sees an old Italian couple in the waiting room and they go off to see the clinician and the... The Italian guy, he's, you know, and he says he looks like he's just come out of his suburban garden plot. He's still got the clay on his boots and he's, you know, that old tango flannelette shirt and his cardigan. He's been in the garden. And when I said walking over to see the doctor, the, the wife just rubs his back and he witnesses that. So essentially it's a story about his, the absence of intimacy in his life and that day of, of that becoming something of real decency, which then has an impact on what he does with this boy who lives downstairs toward the end of the story. Right, because the physical intimacy that he experiences from the very kind doctor um, does bring up uh, a major thing from his past, which is yeah. the, it looks like someone's been putting out cigarettes on him. Yeah, from when and, he was young. and and that that is about, and again, I, I um, no one has ever butted a cigarette on me. I just um, want to say that, but 
it is relative to an interest that I have about childhood trauma and about that impact on you as an adult. And my way of thinking about it is to think about it and to think about whatever those instances of trauma are, there are ways that you, I wouldn't say overcome it, but there's, there are ways that you, you can compartmental it, compartmentalise it in your life if you've got great love around you. Mm. And I think, you know, I was talking to my GP the other week about probably running, um, and she was saying, she said to me, she said, I've... She said, I've known adults who have gone through so much trauma. She said, you can never really get them back. So she tr deals with men and women as adults who have suffered a lot as kids. And her ability is limited in how she can help them get through life. And it's usually through medication. And she says, people who can get back, it really depends on your capacity of resilience. But in, in her view, probably a key to this is, is the networks that you have around you. Yeah. So I have great family, great friends, and I, I find that the, the Joe Roberts individual is, is, is not someone, I don't feel that way, but I wanted to, to write a story that gave a sense of how someone would feel that way when they're completely isolated. Mm. My, I don't know if you know this about me, but my my fam when I was a teenager, my family were foster parents, and mm -hmm. we had kids that were all preschool, zero to four years old, and quite a few of them had cigarette burns on them. Mm. People actually, I, I couldn't believe it as a teenager to find out that people would put their cigarettes. Well, in their, I, I, I mean, kids. I have, I have to say this that um, when I used to go to um, school sports, particularly at Fitzroy Pool, when you go swimming. You'd see other kids ch stripping off, yeah. and you'd see kids with really bad bruises on them, and you would know why, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't ask. Yeah. So that a lot of kids, you just, you just didn't ask, but you all knew. It's that thing of everyone sharing the same secret, which makes it more potent, and you all know what's, hap mm. what's happening in the lives of those kids. Mm. And, and it is interesting because... I went to schools with kids with really different backgrounds. You know, in primary school, mostly Italian kids. In high school, um, Greek and Italians are here tonight making trouble later, probably. Um, is that what you've got to realise is that, you know, these things happen in all sorts of different families. Right. And not in every family, but they happen in different families. Yeah, and, but yet it's often the working class families in literature especially that that sort of exclusively happens to, but that's not the yeah. case at all. Well, but the, you, I think the interesting thing there, and I think it's changing now the way women are writing about abuse within families. Uh, no, yeah, it, it does. Um, middle class generally are much more private hmm. um, for, for opportunity and choice. So, and people think, well, if do the working class really want to sort of open up their lives that way? I think partly it's that you... Privacy is a, a, is a really precious commodity when you're living in those very confined places. Right. And people... You know, I can imagine in the 60s if a social worker had gone out to Camberwell and knocked on someone's door and said, I'm here to rifle through your drawers, um, people say, oh, you can't do that. But in Fitzroy, you know, you, your, your mum would know, well, she would have to negotiate a strategy of how to deal with that person. And just to say no itself could be a real problem. So you might have to... But to think that people can't come in your house, I don't think many people... They know how powerful the police could be. Um, so your rights are, are much more summary. Depends mm. on who, who you're talking to. And let's talk a little bit about um, worship, the other sort of companion yeah. story to this, which is about um, Lola, who's this... Um, I guess she's a recovering alcoholic. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about her? Well, um, this is interesting because Lola is a recovering alcoholic and her daughter allows her to mind her granddaughter Isabel yes. for the first time. And... Again, it's the only, it's not an autobiographical story except that I imagined Isabel, when there's that scene where she, the girl baby pokes her head out of the, the harness and so I imagine Isabel's head coming up with her, right. with her bonnet on. There is another scene in that which I love which is about when she, um, she sees the two teenage kids playing one-on-one -on -one basketball under the light on the, on the estate. And it's interesting, I, it's one of those things as a writer which you would know and any writers here will know. I saw that one night 
yeah, there were these kids. I was running home from Merry Creek and it was winter and these kids were playing one-on-one basketball at, at that linear park on Park Street and the steam's coming off their T-shirts and they're just loving it. And it was under the glow of the, fr- the ring. And it's, I, I don't sort of um, worry about getting older, about the wrinkles and stuff. And I thought, I'd love to be doing that. <laughs> yeah, these kids, it, it's such, it was a boy and a girl. They're about 15 or 16. There's remarkable innocence to it, just real fun. So I wanted to put that in the story. But essentially, it's about a woman getting the chance to, to um, do the right thing, take care of her granddaughter. It's about her day of dealing with a homeless couple or a mum and her son she sees on the street. Um, so I wanted to show the value in this woman. So even though she's, yeah, at one point she said she went, she, one of the reasons she stopped drinking, she went to sleep in Sydney and woke up in the hotel in Ballarat. Um, so she just knew that drinking was not for her. Um, so it was really about, in this case, wanting to show the, the courage of a woman who could change her life but she's still funny, she's really sassy, she's cheeky, so she's not a sort of on the wagon sort of AA meetings every day and sort of hallelujah. She still knows that she's a troublemaker. So when she's doing that association with the bottle, um, yeah. she, it's funny to her. Mm. Um, the other thing, and I, I've said this quite openly, I reckon I admit this, that um, that story... Um, is channeling in part the wonderful, wonderful work of Lucia Berlin, um, her wonderful book of short stories, um, A Handbook for Cleaning Women. I think it's the best short story collection I've read in the last five years. And it's one of those things which you never do on purpose, but when you put her down after being obsessed by her for weeks, you go to write your next story and you look at the draft and you go, ah, oh, that's a poor man's Lucia Berlin story. <laughs> and I think why I decided to put in that story, I think I've got a line. Um, a book was called a, 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 a Manual for Recovering Alcoholics. That's right, yeah. So people who would think, oh, that sounds like, that reads a bit like a Lucia Berlin story to actually fess up to the plagiarism. Um, we'll, we'll come to some questions um, shortly because um, we're down to sort of the last 15 minutes. So if you have any questions, prepare yourself. There will be some roaming mics who will just come to you. Um, but before we do, um, I want to talk about, um, I think it's the first story in the collection, The Ghost Train, Yeah. which is such a cracking opening story um, and such a, a recognisable, for me anyway, um, place, but it's probably a nightmarish, um, unreal place for most people who'd read it. Can you tell us a little bit about this story? Yeah, well, The Ghost Train in part is based on um, a great friend of mine, Danny Ward, who's a um, was awarded life membership of the United Firefighters Union um, yesterday in Adelaide. Um, and a great supporter of the Yes campaign, by the way, the whole UFU were. Um, he were he's a meat boner. So when we were teenagers, we used to wag school and go down to Protein Holding in Richmond every Friday and get a job on the in the boning room or in, in the offal room. And it's quite funny because there were two rooms. One was called the edible offal room. One was called the inedible offal room. <laughs> and I remember I worked in the edible offal and I used to think, oh, shit, I wonder what's going on next door, you know. <laughs> um, and Danny was a boner, but... Um, and, we, and it was quite funny because you'd make enough money so that on the, I've always had a bit of a clothing fetish. Um, I, I could earn enough money to buy a new shirt that Friday, um, something else, and you go to the pub when you were 15 for $2 on a Saturday night and wipe yourself out with a toasted cheese sandwich. So um, Danny was a boner and part of the, what they could do is pick up money on the side. There was an illegal... Um, meat boning abattoir, which they called the ghost train, which you would drive out to the far-flung western suburbs to North Laverton. These mobile freezers would come in, they'd bring in the, the, the cattle or the sheep, whatever they're going to slaughter, and they would literally kill them, cut them, stack them, pack them, freeze them, and then they would just disappear. So by the morning there'd be no trace that anyone had been there, non-unionised, non not covered by health and safety, et cetera, but big, big money for the people who did it. So I always wanted to write a story about this mysterious thing happening out there. But what started the story was these wonderful women. And what I wanted to write a story about two really foul-mouthed women. Lydia um, but, and Marion. Yeah, really foul-mouthed but really um, tough women. Um, who crack Ivan Milat jokes and um, tell dirty jokes about nuns, dirty jokes about Barack Obama. Um, and as I was writing it and they're driving out to this to get on the meat line, what I loved about it is because people might... I'm actually quite conservative, so I never write sex scenes and stuff. And when the words started coming out of their mouth, it was not like, oh, they're channelling me. 
I was actually thinking, oh, my, am I being too rude? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I'm going to let him go. And um, I really love the women. One of them is a sort of a low-level racist, the way that she talks about this Vietnamese woman. But the way that it ends up is, I think, a story that, again, I'm trying to show their value. Yeah, these are, again, they're single women. They've got kids to look after. They've got either useless blokes or blokes that have pissed off and, you know, um, I mean, the fortunate thing of one of them, she does get a, her, her, she does get the breast job before the, the boyfriend had pissed off. So um, things like that. So these are, yeah, these are essentially really tough working class women. They live in the West, so they're all those things that people see as negative, and they're really strong. And I, and I actually really loved writing about them. And it's just cash in hand work for a day's... A day's well, that, cash in hand's always the best, mate. Yes, it is. I, I mean, know. the worst thing that ever happened in this country is the demise of cash in hand. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> we still get it occasionally. My stepdad's here, he knows a lot about cash in hand. But you did a lot of sort of um, unusual jobs whenever you were young, because you used to be a firefighter, weren't you? Yeah, and I, I mean, that's not unusual. I think the no. most unusual job I did was that when I went to university in the first year tutorial, the tutor said, oh, we're going to warm up by telling people what sort of jobs you may have done, you know, which is weird because most of them were 18-year-old girls who their only job was getting to Melbourne University from after Slaves College. But um, um, <laughs> this girl sitting next to me who, who, you know, talk about hygiene, I think she, that worried her just sitting next to me. And uh, she said, what sort of jobs have you done? I said, well, I think the most interesting job I ever had was a surgical barber. And she said, what's that? I said, well, I work in a hospital in the operating theatre during the day and for overtime I shave pubic hair for, for people who are going to be operated on the next day. And she said, what? <laughs> I said, I shave pubic hair. And she literally, she sort of started going back and then she crawled up the wall and slid out the window. So, <laughs> But I mean, a lot of, I, my first full-time, my first full-time job was, was as a telegram boy in Richmond. Um, telegram boy? Yeah. Uh, it'll take a long time to explain. Right, okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a technology, we're going to bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions for Tony? There are some roving mics who will approach you menacingly. Well, we're not allowed to do that, are we? Do they have any questions? There must be a question. Too shy? Let us know if you have any questions. Um, here, there's one down oh, the front. There's one here. This he hasn't got a, give this man a microphone, he's going to sing. <laughs> Lovely hearing you talk about the working class growing up. Where do you see the working class today? Where do you see him? Out of Footscray where I work now. Um, <laughs> it, it is an interesting question because I think that um, in fiction and I mean, Chris might have an idea here. In fiction, you don't see the working class much at all, except in sort of very narrow stereotypes. So I think, I hope, one of the objectives in this book in particular, but in all my work, is that I show people in a light, not romantically, that, but which is fully dimensional. When I talk about working class, um, I'm not talking about white working class, I'm talking about working class people, so that, you yeah, know, for Aboriginal people, class people might know this class is a really important issue for Aboriginal people. The alignments between Aboriginal people and other communities is often based on, on class alliances. When I grew up in the inner city, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, the you know, kids that I knew in Fitzroy and Richmond would come from all over the world, literally all over the world, and their parents were working class. Yeah, they, most of them worked in factories and they worked really hard when they came here. And I think even though my parents, our parents' generations, there wasn't a lot of contact. Um, the, a friend of mine's got this great saying, you know, we own the emotional vibration of the street. And I think what was great about growing up in the inner city in the 70s in particular is that those kids might come from so many different backgrounds, but there was that commonality between you. And again, I, I say this quite seriously, the friendships I have today go back to that time and they're as strong as they are because even though our demographic has changed and you know, we're a bit cashed up and doing better, but our values are very similar, so I see those as really important. Um, and in a sense, 
outside fiction, I think one of the, the issues that, that interests me today is that um, what I call the, you know, I'm getting a bit academic here, but the demise of affiliation where people were affiliated to, to unions or to factories or to church or whatever. And um, people might think, well, why church? But yeah, again, I was an altar boy at All Saints Fitzroy. A lot of the Italian community who went there, some of them were there for the mass, but a lot of them were there were just to connect up with each other. When I worked at the abattoirs in Richmond, you know, a lot of those men who worked on those, they were from different parts of different, yeah, you know, the Greek guys had their own table, the Yugoslav guys had their own table, and they would talk about where they, their old country, and then, of course, they would interact together. So what I see today is this sort of sense of, of the notion of class being both a derogatory or negative term and not understanding that those values that people hold are still really strong. Um, so. Where I see it today, I think I see that these notions being abandoned by parties. And it's interesting that any time someone talks about inequality in Australia at a political level, the Liberal Party talk about this is class warfare on the part of the Labor Party, and the Labor Party shit themselves and back off a discussion of inequality because they don't want to be seen to be talking about class. So I don't see any major... There's not a... a well, there's not a... a, a the values of, of, of poorer people are not represented um, in the parliament. Um, so, it's, I mean, it's interesting, I know this goes back to what happened to you tonight. One of the things I'm interested about Patrick White is that when he became a great supporter of Gough, Gough Whitlam after the dismissal, now people, I think, mistake it just for him being outraged about the, you know, the, the Crown getting involved in something, there was, a, there was an essential sense of fairness in that support, and I think that notion of fairness now, people see it as you're being romantic if you talk about fairness for all people. So I think it's it's a real problem at the moment. Do you think class is more about values rather than um, oh, your, absolutely rather than your financial yeah, situation? Yeah, and, and I'm, I mean it is interesting you say that because I, yeah, I'm a university professor. I go to the Nova Cinema, and I can <laughs> I can buy any book I want to buy. Like, and this is serious. When I was a kid, the notion that you would buy a book. You have yourself, well, am I going to buy a book or am I going to eat? Buy a book, will I eat? I think I'll eat. Um, you wouldn't have bought a book. You might get one from the op shop. The library. We were great. We were great um, library. You know, I, I was so lucky to have the public library when I was a kid. So even though I was a, a bit of a troublemaker, I always read. So you love literature. The notion that poorer people don't love literature, for instance, mm. is a joke. And, and again, yeah, my mum, I, I give her a big pile of books every now and then. Yeah, because I get... I remember when I got books sent to me for the Stella Prize. I had about... Because I was a judge on the Stella, I had about 60 books. I give them to my mum. She reads every one. And I, the, last week I was down there and she told me about a book she just read that I'd give her. And she, I thought, you should be reviewing for the age. <laughs> <laughs> so I know my, step, my stepdad used to be a voracious reader. And, and so that I think it's a, that thing that... Class is about class in the sense of values is interesting because when you to withhold something from poorer people or working class people, you have to give it a monetary value. If people can access it that doesn't have a monetary value, it's a lot less to exclude. It's a lot more difficult to exclude people. Mm. So when I grew up, the notion that reading wouldn't be valued, or I, we loved film, you know, we always went to film, and we yeah we went to popular film. But my love of film comes from going to pictures. It doesn't come from going to university and talking theoretical bullshit, you know, mm. which people may have heard if they've been to Melbourne University. <laughs> Do you think there's an expansion of what working class means now? Because with wages having stagnated and um, everything being super expensive for everybody and we're all sort of... You think it's getting... It's becoming a bigger category in our, in our society than we no, acknowledge? No, see, that's interesting. We know, that, we know that wages have really stagnated and this is, again, my, my frustration. I think what's happened, and again, it goes back to the stories in this book or the way you value people. What has happened is that rather than understanding that there's something collectively poorer people have in common that they could in fact benefit those communities, I think the media and politicians get great benefit out of poorer people or different communities sort of turning on each other mm. and blaming each other, whereas in fact is, is what you hold in common should be something that allows you to, to, to unify and bond. And again, when I was growing up, the notion that you would turn on kids or their families because they were from another country would just be 
you know, unheard of. I mean, I'm, and I'm not suggesting that racism wasn't an issue for my friends, and I know it was, but again, I also know that our friendships and our loyalty to each other is something, again, that bound us. And, and I think that, yeah, the, the, there's a real problem in being able to deal with that when, when I think political parties don't want to witness that happening. Mm. Well, even in these stories, that's, it's interesting how the, the originality of the characters is, is rarely stated. It's only stated mm -hmm. explicitly in a couple of cases. And I guess you did that on, on purpose so people No, I, I, it's interesting. People always ask me that. I, I actually don't do it on purpose. Is, is that, that if you take a story like Worship, what I want to do in that story is to say, here's a woman who has suffered alcoholic abuse, mm. And she could be representative of any number of women. She could be an Aboriginal yeah, woman. She could be a, a white woman. She could be an Italian woman. We don't know. Yeah. And when I say we don't know, in that sort of story, what I'm trying to suggest is this is what many women go through and what many women overcome for the love of family. So I want her to be representative of a lot of women. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't want a reader to read that or a woman to read and think, oh yeah, that's about that sort of woman or that yep. sort of woman, that it could be any of us. And again, my, 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 my sense is that there are, again, there are many things that people in what we might call various identity communities hold in common. Mm. And I don't say this in, an, you know, in a homogenising way and just lumping us together because there are still really strong distinctions. But again, it goes back to my experience of growing up and my experience of friendship is that those friendships are based on accepting that there are things that me and my friends would be held in difference. You know, I didn't go to Greek school on a Saturday morning, um, for instance. Greek kids went to Greek school. There were things that other kids did that you didn't, didn't, you didn't do and you understood that. But again, there were things that bound us. And they're the things that I want to focus on, the things that bind us. Or if there's difference, that you understand why those differences occur. Because you also understand that there's the private self, which, I mean, just, I know we're going to close soon, and this is important. If I was writing about, you know, teenage characters in the inner Melbourne in the 70s, there are things that I could write about my Greek and Italian friends what I would understand through our connection with school, the street, mm. down the river... But what happened in their households, I have no understanding of. And nor should I, and nor should I write about it. Because, yeah, when we talk now as older people, I understand that there are things about their private lives which are well, great, the people, great survivors of coming from the other side of the world and, you know, making them straight, but also a great sadness of leaving behind places that they loved mm. and that their families loved. And also, like with me, some of them having very difficult fathers. Um, but it's almost like we owned the street and our parents owned the houses. And what's the weirdest thing is my, my, my mother never, ever once told me ever that I couldn't bring a certain kid home, never. And I've spoken to this about a Italian mate of mine. His mother never, ever, ever said that to him. And I went to school with all, only Italian kids at um, Sacred Heart and Fitzroy and St. Patrick's. Never once did I go into an Italian kid's home. Or once, one rare, and never once did I take an Italian kid home. And no one ever told us that we couldn't. And if, if they had, I don't think, you know, my mother wouldn't have said, get that Italian kid out of the house. There was something about, without ever being told, we thought that there was a private self that we wouldn't broach yet. And I think we're the generation that changed that. We broke that down mm. so that I think we're lucky. I think that post-war generation of kids who grew up, you know, any kids that grew up from the 50s into the 70s and beyond, we're so lucky to have changed Australia. And I think we changed it just by our interaction. And, you know, that's... If, you know, Australia's a problematic place, but if someone says, well, what are the values that you have? It's, they're the values that, that we created a valuable place for us and, yeah, my kids would, would never consider the notion that, yeah, my kids have brought kids home from all over the world. So the notion that they wouldn't, that, that, that changed. Mm. And I think it was our generation that, that allowed that to change. And Australia continues to embrace change. I hope so. 
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Please, please thank Tony Birch. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.